Would I ever, would I ever in a million years talk to somebody the way that that person's talking to me? If not, for me, that's emotional abuse. What is up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution. And if you're new to my channel, my channel is all about mental health. So if you're into improving your mental and emotional well-being, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. So yeah, it is time for the January Patreon Q&A. But before we get started, look what you are missing out on over on Instagram by not following me. Daddy, I don't feel so good. Oh no, my baby boy is sick. Oh, thank God I have these cough drops. Thanks, Daddy. Wait, are you a licensed professional? And there's a lot more where that came from coming real soon. So go follow me at The Rewired Soul. Try to get to 10,000 followers. All right, but yeah, anyways, we're doing the Patreon Q&A. I love all of you so much supporting the channel over on Patreon. Those of you who can't support the channel over on Patreon, that's cool too, baby. Watch my videos, watch the ads, whatever it is, right? But anyways, the reason why I do the Patreon Q&A, I get dozens, if not hundreds of messages a day through DM, through tweet, through email, people asking me to talk about this subject or that subject or whatever. And I wish, I wish that I had enough time to answer everybody's questions, to do all of the videos about all the things, but I can't. So every month I do a Patreon Q&A. This is open to everybody on Patreon, whether you're only doing a dollar a month or you're doing $50 a month, whatever it is, you get to participate in the Patreon Q&A and I try to answer all of the questions, all right? So let's get started. First question is, what is your opinion on Hollywood making movies about mental health? I know psychology isn't your expertise per se, but it would be interesting to hear your opinion. I've seen YouTubers criticize movies like Split because of its outlandish representation of DID, and now they're making a sequel to it. Do you think these movies are making uh, the stigma against mental health grow even more? All right, you know what's interesting? Tristan and I just saw Glass yesterday. Ooh hoo hoo, love that movie. But yeah, someone actually gave, uh, sent me like a sassy tweet about Split and DID, and it's it's a yes and no. It's, you know, here's the thing. Like, I when it comes to mental health, like, we have, to, we have to work on our, ourselves. Like something I always try to teach you guys is it's a lot easier for me to work on how I, I handle the world rather than it is expecting the rest of the world to change, right? So that is why I don't really get offended too easily. That's why I'm not hoping that Hollywood or anybody is gonna change the way they do things. In my opinion, in my experience, most movies, TV shows, whatever it is that are depicting mental illness, they're more using it to drive a plot than actually showing it as, you know, mental illness, right? Now, there are some movies that do a great job. I've seen some movies that do a great job depicting mental illness or depicting addiction or recovery or what therapy looks like or whatever it is. But I, I truly believe that we need to, like when we're going into um, a movie or a TV show, we just need to remember like, this is fantasy, this is fiction. Like, like, let's talk about Split, let's talk about Glass, right? Like, this is like a superhero movie. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't walk into a superhero movie expecting them to depict mental illness in a perfect way. I expect them to do it in a way that's gonna drive the plot of a superhero movie. Now, um, last season of 13 Reasons Why, like, I did a bunch of reviews and there was a bunch of backlash and people were upset about it and, you know, all these other things. And to my understanding, now, pfft, to my understanding, some people who are outraged about it, they were upset because of the way the show is marketed. Like, people from the show, the writers and like Selena Gomez and some others, they marketed it as like, as something that's really showing like mental illness or depression or whatever. But they kind of like glamorize some things, sensationalize some things and things like that. So if something isn't marketed as this is an accurate depiction of DID or depression or you know anxiety or whatever it is, if it's not marketed like that, we just need to realize, hey, this is for entertainment purposes. Just sit back, relax, enjoy a movie. You know what I mean? Next question. What are some tips you have on how to have a positive body image? I know negative body image is a big problem in our society and it is often just a small part of a more in-depth issue. I feel like giving some tips on how to think about oneself in a more positive way would be helpful. Excellent question. So I don't know if you got the memo, but I'm a little bit chunky. 
And I always had body image issues, always. So this right here, this is a picture of myself and my best friend Alex back in high school. I am about 200, no, 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 probably only about 150 pounds heavier than I was in that picture. Well, even when I was much smaller, I still had body image issues. I always thought I was fat and stuff. Like sometimes I fantasize about if I had a time machine, I would go back in time, slap the hell out of my high school stuff self and be like, you're not fat, this is fat, calm down. You know what I mean? But anyway, something that I often tell people or teach all of you is like, when I talk to you about like money isn't gonna make you happy, it's the same thing with the body image thing. We think once we get to a certain weight or we think once we get this uh, type of cosmetic surgery, like I'm not against cosmetic surgery, I'm not against losing weight. I've lost about 50 pounds in the last year or so and I'm still, you know, doing like things to try to eat healthy. I need to get my butt back in the gym. I've gone vegetarian, it's been over a year. All these other things, right? But I know I need to get down even more. Um, good news is I just saw my doctor and she says my heart's doing really well. It could be doing better because I had congestive heart failure six years ago. But anyway, something that I had to do was learn how to love myself exactly the way I was before, before I, I could get happy at a lighter weight, right? Now, body image has to do with a lot of different things, right? Because some people, it's not like me, it's not weight. Maybe you don't like your, your hips or your nose or your eyebrows or whatever. Um, some people like to point it out, like I didn't realize that I got a freaking gigantic forehead, which I've had since I was like five years old. You know what I mean? Like there's all these different things that we wish that we could change about ourselves, but part of it is just acceptance, right? But we also need to remember, like especially when you know, you when you have a significant other or, you, or you're married or whatever, like, believe people when they tell you that, you know, they're attracted to you, right? Like, some of us, you know, we want more love, more affection, we want all these things, but if we're not believing that person, then we're not truly accepting it. You see what I mean? So we need to start accepting ourselves on what we, what we are and who we are and working on what we can. The last thing I'll say about this is, the way I work on my mental health, I do not waste time focusing on things I cannot change, right? I focus on what I can change. So my weight, for example, I cannot complain about my weight unless I'm trying to do something about my weight. Does that make sense? So I, I hope that answers your questions. Body image is different for everybody. You know, I see people who are a third of my size who don't like their, their, you know, their body, right? So it's gonna be different for everybody. But I do suggest um, like working on you know self-love and self-compassion and all that kind of stuff. Question, we're seeing more and more people struggle with social anxiety today, even though social media is at its height. What are your thoughts on this and what are some of your best suggestions for those who do struggle to leave the house or face real life people at events, et cetera? <laughs> That's a great question. I could do entire videos about this, right? So yeah, we are more social, we are more connected than ever before, but we a lot uh, like anxiety and depression are higher than they've ever been before too. So this kind of goes back to that body image question too. So a lot of us are seeing things on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, right? Or even advertisements of the most beautiful people or, you know, quote unquote, beautiful people or whatever it is. And this can make us not happy with ourselves. You know what I mean? Now, I am somebody who, like, I grew up, you know, in the 90s when, like, AOL first came out and chat rooms, and I've just always been more comfortable talking to people online than I was in person. It's funny, Tristan and I were just having a conversation, like, now I'm much more social, like, I'm able to be. Like, there are times when my social anxiety, like, plays tricks on me and stuff like that, but there's there's yes and no to this, right? So I think we need to find a healthy balance of, you know, communicating with each other online because, I am not one of those people who are like, you know, get rid of all social media, blah, 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 right? Because we can be more connected than ever before. But if we're just mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, like, and not like making connections with people, then it is just one of these like mindless things that we're doing, which then it's difficult to act in social situations, right? So if I'm just scrolling through not having conversations, that affects me. So that's one of the reasons I love everybody in the Facebook group or in the Discord server, or some of you are in both, like have conversations with, uh, with people and stuff. But a lot of social anxiety is we are caring far too much about what people think about us when 
re the reality is we need to care about what we think of us. You know what I mean? Next question. I've been getting into writing scary stories for my channel because that's the content I feel the most comfortable making. However, after a month or so working with my therapist, I think we've established that I fall into the category for panic disorder. On the surface, it doesn't seem to make sense that someone with panic disorder would be comfortable writing scary stories. I speculate that it may be because I don't have control over what I'm afraid of in real life, but when I'm writing scary stories, I have control over what scares me. But again, that's just speculation. As someone who works in mental health, in the mental health field, what do you think could be the reason? Is this the question we were talking about, Tristan? So Tristan, this is, this is very interesting. Either, like, either was this exact question or somebody else was talking. No, 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 I think we were talking about it in a live stream, right? In case you didn't know, Tristan's right over there. So Tristan, um, Tristan loves scary stuff. And like, uh, we were talking about this one time and this is just a theory, this is a hypothesis. Like maybe there's some research or some studies out there that I can look into. That would be interesting. Maybe Tristan could help me look into that, right? But the way Tristan was explaining to me why she likes scary movies, because I hate them. I hate scary movies. I hate jump scares. Like I remember we went to go see, uh, uh, what was it, Insidious or something like that. I remember just getting pissed. This game, I'm just like, hurry up and scare me. Ugh. But what Tristan was saying is like, in that movie, like she knows, she knows like, I am here. It is going to be scary. It is going to scare me, right? Like she knows that. And then, you know, after the movie, that's gone. That's it, right? So yeah, a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety. I know mine personally, a lot of my anxiety had to do with control. So what I would assume, what I would assume, this is just an assumption, you writing, you writing puts you back into control, right? And this is one of the reasons why journaling or writing stories can be very beneficial to people because a lot of anxiety is fear of the unknown. But when you are in control of that story or that situation, I would imagine like that's why um, you're a lot more calm. Well, I don't even imagine. When you are in more control, you have less anxiety. Like that's just, that's just science, baby. So that's what I think about that. But this is great. I know a bunch of you out there, like a lot of you love the Stephen King video I made. So thank you for that question and maybe I'll do some more research on it. Next question is, I am interested in learning more about emotional abuse. I am particularly interested in covert abuse and how to detect and stop it. So that's interesting. Um, to be honest, that is something that I'm still learning about. Like, here's, here's the thing. So I'm gonna say this. I get a lot of questions about emotional abuse because this is huge. This is huge. Right? I've been in many, 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 many abu uh, emotionally abusive relationships for way too long. Um, Tristan got me a book that I wanted on gaslighting that uh, I'm gonna start pretty soon, hopefully. I think that's the next like regular physical book I'm gonna read because I'm usually like reading one of those and I'm reading like uh, an audio book. But yeah, um, but anyways, a lot of people ask me about abuse. Like when it comes to abuse, emotional abuse, like I always tell people, watch my videos on boundaries. Like watch my videos on boundaries. And like when it comes to boundaries and setting boundaries, like you need to understand what you deserve and how you wanna be treated. So for, and, and not the lies that your brain tells you, like everybody deserves to be treated with respect, to be treated with love, to be treated with kindness, to be treated with patience, to be treated with tolerance, right? Let's put it this way, okay. How do you spot emotional abuse? This is, this is what I do, okay? Would I ever, would I ever in a million years talk to somebody the way that that person's talking to me? If not, for me, that's emotional abuse. But again, like some of this, some of this is perception, right? Some of us are very sensitive, very, very sensitive. And that's why gaslighting's so tricky too, is um, when, when we're overly sensitive or we're not sure if somebody's gaslighting us, we need to talk to other people. We need to get a second opinion. Like sometimes I have to ask, you know, Tristan or a friend, like I'll have to show them something, like maybe a message, or even when I was um, working at the treatment center, I would have to show them uh, uh, an email and say like, am I getting too defensive over this? Because sometimes the way I interpret something is 1000% different than somebody else is. So this is why meditation and mindfulness and having a support group to bounce things off of is so important. A lot of us have a, a screwed up mental filter. And what that means is information comes in, our brain scrambles it up, 
and it makes us feel some type of way, our brain lies to us like, oh, that person's talking down to you. Oh, that person doesn't like you. That person's being condescending. Oh, that person da 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 da, right? So emotional abuse is a very real thing, but we also need to work on not being so damn sensitive all the time. So like, there's, there's this balance that comes into it. So I think the rule of thumb that you should use is, would I talk to anybody in that same way, right? But like, for example, Y'all know me, I'm Tough Love Chris, and some people who are very sensitive, they don't like that, right? So even though I'm not, you know, I'm not being emotionally abusive, they might take it as such just because they're more sensitive. Where there's people like me, where I need people to give me tough love, right? Where they are hard on me, they call me out on my BS, they're stern with me. I need those people in my life, but I, I don't get overly sensitive about it anymore. So I hope that makes sense. Best thing that you can do, Go get some books on emotional abuse, like the book I got on gaslighting, and educate yourself. Usually most of these books written by doctors or therapists or you know whoever it is, they have a lot of real life examples in there. It's not mental health related, but I'd still like to know how you and Tristan met on a cruise ship. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just don't want to go on a cruise, you silly billies. No, uh, <laughs> no. So here's a fun fact. Like I, I, I legit think that almost every girlfriend I've ever had, like I've met through some kind of online thing. Like remember I was saying I'm, I'm more comfortable online than I am in person? Like even though like I was going to the bars all the time back in my drinking days and stuff, I wasn't the type of guy who would just like hit on a girl at like a bar or whatever like that. So uh, Tristan and I actually met on the wonderful dating app OkCupid. And we talked for a little bit, we talked for a few weeks, like I, I was feeling her out, she was feeling me out, and then I drove all the way across town because I'm such a sweetheart, to a Starbucks where we had our first date, and I probably even paid for it. Did I pay for Starbucks? I think so. Yeah, yeah, probably. You so yeah. Tell them, tell them a story. Huh? Tell them a story. About how I almost stopped talking to you? Yeah. yeah. So those of you like, one of the reasons I talk to you guys about like uh, black and white thinking so much is because Tristan almost lost lost me. She almost lost this chunk of man right here. <laughs> no, there was like one day, and it was back when I was living uh, with my old roommate, one of my good friends, Nikki, and like I wanted to hang out with Tristan. Had we already met by then or no? No, we hadn't met by then. But yeah, I wanted to hang out with her. Like I didn't have my son that day. Like dating was hard, like, you know, um, because I had my son on the weekends and Tristan was uh, being a, a full-time nanny to her little cousin. And whatever, like, and we were gonna meet up on a weekend and then she was like, oh, I'm tired. I'm just gonna sleep all day. And I'm like, are you serious right now? Are you serious right now? So all of you who are single, like, there's this healthy balance between not putting up with any BS but also giving people a chance. So I was livid. I was livid. I'm like, you know what? I am done with this chick. You'd rather sleep than come hang out with me. And I was like losing it. And like my friend Nikki and I, we went outside and smoke. And I was telling her, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> and she's like, Chris, how about you calm down? Give her another chance. Maybe she's just tired. So Nikki is actually the one who is responsible for this loving relationship and we've been together for over two years. But anyways, you guys, that's why I keep teaching you to work on your black and white thinking because Tristan went from all good to all bad real quick. Next question is, how can I start to improve the relationship I have with my mom when she's a bit older and of the mindset that she's too old to change? We've gone through a lot. She's all I have left really, but we really clash hard. That's a great question. So a few things. Now, um, I had to realize a long time ago that I can't change anybody. This goes back to what I was saying earlier in this video. You do not have the power to change anybody. The, the more you, you, you exert your energy or even your mental or emotional energy thinking that you're gonna change somebody, you are wasting time, right? You are wasting time. So my mom and I, my mom's actually on her way into town right now as I'm recording this, and when I first got sober, my mom and I still had a really rough relationship, right? And there were so many things I didn't like about her and all that stuff, and we took a break. I didn't talk to her for a few months because I had to work on me, okay? So we have an amazing relationship now, and she hasn't changed at all. So I always tell my clients when I tell this story, like, think about that for a second. My mom and I have a, an amazing relationship now. She didn't change at all, so what does that mean? That means the change came from within me. The change is me and how I respond to her, all right? But anyways, um, 
I made a video about how I forgave my alcoholic mom and I, I highly suggest, I highly suggest any of you who have these types of issues, you go check that video out, all right? But anyways, the last thing I'll say, uh, uh, I wanted to start out with the you can't change anybody, but anybody out there who's watching this and you're older, Remember, neuroplasticity, okay? The brain never stops changing. It is never too late. The the old saying that uh, old dogs can't learn new tricks or whatever it is, like, yes, they can, okay? Neuroplasticity, all right? That's just the way the brain works. The brain doesn't stop changing and uh, improving until the day you die, all right? So if you're alive, you still have a chance. Next question is, I'm trying to get my husband to dedicate time to our relationship, but it's like pulling teeth. I finally managed to get him to agree to going to a dance class with me because I think it It'll be a great way to build intimacy and communication, and if we find it silly, we can laugh about it. I've tried explaining to him that it's important to me that we spend time together, but how do I get him to think it's good too? I've told him it's cheaper than a therapist, which I want to do as well. Great question. So the first thing I'll say is be grateful. Be grateful that he's doing that, okay? That is extremely important, all right? Now, the other thing I'll say is like, Manage your expectations with it. Like, I can already tell just from this, like, I wanna go there, I wanna laugh, I wanna have a good time, and you know, whatever it is, right? Like, be grateful that he's going, okay? And when I say that, it's just baby steps. I'm not saying, like, be grateful and, like, kiss the ground that he walks on or anything, but we need to celebrate small victories. Now, in my, in my opinion, this part about, like, what I, I wanna go to therapy as well, I talked about this in a different video, right? I personally do not believe in couples therapy as much as I believe in individual therapy. So couples therapy is great, but I think individual therapy is much better. I have seen many relationships begin to heal just because one person was getting their butt to therapy. All right? So if I, I wouldn't wait around for your husband to go to therapy, like it's great that he's going to the dance, dance classes, but I would recommend that you go to therapy, start working on issues of why you feel neglected, why you feel this, working with a therapist on a weekly, bi-weekly or monthly basis and learning to set up, you know, boundaries and working on your communication and how to respond and all these other things, that will definitely help. And anybody out there, like if, if you don't have access to therapy through insurance or you know, your, your medical provider, whoever it is, right? My channel is partnered with BetterHelp Online Therapy. You can do it from your phone, your computer, whatever it is, link is always down in the description. It'll be in the pinned comment as well. Next question is, would you uh, talk about the logical fallacies? I think it's so important to understand ways in which people try to prove a point or win a debate using bad logic. Many YouTubers utilize these. Anyway, I really love the science you feature. I'd love to see a collab with you see a collab with a neuroscientist or psychiatrist. I love your mom, perhaps continuing on the subject of impulse control. You could bring one of the science YouTubers cutaway style to explain, or perhaps drug and alcohol addiction science, or the science of instant gratification. Gosh, there's so much and so many YouTubers to choose from. <laughs> I love this. This is an exciting question. Logical fallacies. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've heard the term tossed around and stuff, um, but yeah, I do want to learn more about it. Here's the thing. Like, I debate const, like, not constantly. My debates last about five minutes, okay? I usually reply to people once, maybe twice in my comments and things like that. But yeah, like you're saying, a lot of YouTubers use these tactics and everything. Um, I think it's important to just understand and trust your knowledge while also being open to new ideas, right? A lot of us get stuck when we get stubborn and we don't, we don't think about you know the possibility of a new idea. Now, um, I do wanna do more research on it, so hopefully I'll be able to dedicate a video to it. So on the topic of neuroscientists, that's actually a good, good idea. So some of you have heard me mention um, Dr. Judson Brewer. He's a neuroscientist, he's also a psychiatrist. He runs, um, he's like the director of research for uh, the Mindfulness Institute. And yeah, he and I, we haven't talked in a while, but he, I actually did an interview with him when my channel first started. So yeah, maybe I can get some questions together for a neuroscientist and talk and reach out to him and see if I can get him as a guest on my channel. But yeah, my mom, you know, uh, she has a PhD in psychology. Um, also the doctor, uh, Faith Harper, who's made uh, books that I've recommended to all of you. Um, I wanna talk to her and get her as a guest too. Next question, what do you think about Dear Evan Hansen, since the main character is depressed and anxious and goes to therapy? Great question, I actually saw this question, I was like, 
who the heck is Dear Evan Hansen? So I saw this was like based on a book, then it turned into like a musical and they're doing Broadway and stuff. So whoever asked this question, I am going to try to see if there's a way I can see it and then maybe I can do a review on it. But I was reading some information about it after I saw this question posted in Patreon and uh, it seems interesting. So I'm gonna check it out and then I will get back to you. Next question is, I hope I'm not too late for this. Just saw your Keemstar gaslighting video and it made me think of something. I was in a long-term relationship where I think I was uh, gaslit on occasion, but the person would constantly accuse me of doing the gaslighting. Normally the disagreements were about semantics. We would remember a different uh, word choice being used. It was really uh, petty, but the gaslighting accusations were uh, very serious to me. I have always wanted to do the right thing, but I genuinely don't think I have gaslighting and even proved him wrong on occasion. But over the years of this, I began to question reality and what was really truth. My question for you is how do you know uh, who is the one actually doing the gaslighting? Is that possible with this di dynamic? Are there any sure tests to prove one way or another? I hope this made sense. Thanks for all you do, Chris. Yeah, it makes sense. One of the biggest issues, I'll say this right now, one of the biggest issues that I found in a lot of my relationships where we were constantly fighting was there, there's like this, this, this competition to see who's right. And that's what it sounds like from this, right? You, like, who's right? Like, it's this, comp like, who wins? Who wins? Oh, you're the one who did it. Oh, da, 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 right? And it's like you're keeping score and keeping tabs. That's an issue right there. Like, that is a huge issue. But I will tell you guys, the antidote to gaslighting is to bounce things off of other people. But here's the thing too, in your specific situation, you gotta be honest. Like if I'm, because obviously there's two sides to every story, so you have to have a lot of self-awareness and then whoever you're talking to, you need to check your motives. Like, am I, am I, am I lightening up the things that I said to try to look good to my friend so they agree with me? You know what I mean? So you gotta be very, very honest. But this is another reason why a lot of people need therapy to talk about these things. And I'm not sure if you're still in this relationship or if it's an ex. If it's an ex, let it go. Start working on yourself, your self-awareness, maybe get into therapy, all right? But also remember, like in a relationship, if you're trying to just win, you're, you're not in a healthy relationship. Next question. I realized my last question wasn't a question you'd be able to answer in, in a sitting. Sorry, I already did, baby. Uh, <laughs> here's, uh, here's one that's on my mind. Hey, Chris, what are your thoughts on seasonal affective disorder? I really suffer, I already suffer from GAD and minor depression. So GAD is generalized anxiety disorder. That's my diagnosis as well. Um, I've considered getting a Verilux lamp for my office where I spend most of my day. I'd like to know more about why this time of year is so difficult for people. All right, so I was actually talking, Tristan and I were talking about this a lot um, during the holiday season. So for those of you who don't know what seasonal affective disorder, it is kind of what it sounds like. Like you get more depressed uh, when the weather changes, all right? Here's what I think. Here's what I think and here's why a lot of people need to go to therapy and get a proper diagnosis is, is because like, you guys, like I, it's almost like since, and I'm not saying anything about you, like, who asked this question, but I just want all of you to consider this, okay? Is it possible that the holidays just bum you out? Like the holidays suck for a lot of people, okay? Thanksgiving, Christmas, a month and a half later, you got Valentine's Day. Like holidays suck sometimes, okay? For many, many, many years, holidays just sucked. So it wasn't necessarily seasonal uh, affective disorder as much as just the holidays bummed me out. So yeah, like, it's just, that's why that's why so many of us need to get the proper diagnosis. And this is what, you know, and here's, here's a little, uh, here's a little, a little sass for you too. Like, uh, not you specifically who asked this question, but like when people think that I'm diagnosing people, no, heck no, right? Because the thing is like you, you talked about this lamp, those of you who don't know, that's a special lamp that can help with seasonal affective disorder. But if you don't go out and get a proper diagnosis, you're gonna be treating the wrong thing, right? Imagine me breaking my leg and getting a brace for my arm, right? So this is why we need to get a proper diagnosis. So if you're, if you, if you have a borderline personality disorder and you're trying to, trying to treat bipolar disorder, it's not gonna go very well. Does that make sense? So this is why you should get a proper diagnosis, but I do think that a lot of people need to start figuring out within themselves, like maybe this isn't seasonal affective disorder, maybe the holidays just kind of bum me out because they're very they're two very different things. Last question, 
Hey there, I was wondering if you'd do a video about Donald Trump's mental state. If not, that's understandable. <laughs> so, sure, I'll answer it. Like, I will I will say this. Like, I try not to get too political uh, on my channel. I have a few times, especially when it comes to, like, mental health and, you know, the stigma and medical care and all of that. I will say this. Something that I've noticed is that when I talk about YouTubers and getting off of Twitter when you're in an emotional state because you're not using your prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for emotional regulation, impulse control, you know, uh, all these things, right? A lot of people bring up Donald Trump. So even though I don't know if Donald Trump would have any type of diagnoses or any type of personality disorder, I do know that this dude likes to tweet like a mofo when he can't control his emotions or his impulses. So that is my thought, which I will say in a video, all right? <laughs> But if that, if that bummed any of you out, like, trust me, there's a bunch of Democrats who tweet out stupid stuff, too. All right, but anyways, thank you all so much for your questions. This was a really good one. Sometimes when I do these uh, Patreon Q&As, I don't get many questions, but hey, and I actually answered every single question. Every single question. So if you stayed here and through the whole thing, kudos to you. You're amazing. But um, again, I do these Patreon Q and A's and I try to answer all the questions, which I was able to do today, um, because I get a lot of requests all the time. So if you wanna guarantee that I answer your questions, um, make sure you sign up on Patreon. It's as little as a dollar a month. At $5, you get exclusive videos. Um, $10, you get like discounts. $20, we do monthly group calls. $30, uh, my lovely, amazing, talented Tristan draws you a picture. $50, you get a one-on-one uh, -on -one with me once a month. And yeah, go just go check out the Patreon and see all the different rewards and stuff like that. All right, but anyways, that's all I got for this video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And a huge thank you to all of you, all of you patrons out there. Love you all, thanks for supporting the channel. And here's a link for Patreon right there if you wanna sign up and be part of next month's Q&A, all right? Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.